You picture them. You hear their voices and capture them in your mind. Two boys, their voices lob through the muggy air from the park below the house where they play cricket. It's early on Sunday morning of Waitangi weekend, New Zealand's national holiday to commemorate the signing of the treaty between Tangata Whenua and Queen Victoria. Waitangi is far away in the north, beyond Mount Cargo, Kapukato Mahaka, the sleeping giant who shields us here in Ōtipoti, Dunedin. Where I now lie in bed, listening to two boys playing cricket at Prospect Park. I wasn't got the wickets. For that. Yeah. I wasn't rooting for that. It doesn't matter. Got yeah. the wickets. Oh, it... <sighs> the whack of ball against Willow. The boys' voices rising with the sun and the heat. Calls and yells pitched through the open window, then bouncing off the opposite wall. I run. He runs and runs. Runs into the trees at the side of the field. <coughs> a third player. A girl. <laughs> You don't see me, but I see you. I am Louise Hepburn, an invisible woman in the Edinburgh of the South. You shun the watchers until you need to break open our memory banks. This is a story about my Dunedin, Ōtipoti, the place of the steep points at the bottom of the world. Someone else would tell the story differently, but this is my story. Hell breathes as heaven looks on. The sun is high and bright today. You hold your hand across your forehead as a visor to shield from the glare. People are shadows inked in umbra. Panic rises with the heat. There were only two boys playing cricket at the park. I thought I heard a girl, but the girl wasn't playing. Police are seeking information relating to the brutal assault of a young woman in Dunedin. She was discovered by two boys playing cricket at Prospect Park at the northern end of the town belt. Police would like to speak to anyone who witnessed suspicious behaviour in the area between 10pm last night and 6am this morning. Prospect Park is centred with a sports field, which is circled by a road lassoing it to the end of the town belt, stopping it from tipping down the Bullock Track to Leith Valley and Woodhall Gardens below. If you're batting at Prospect Park on an east-west trajectory, there's a chance you'll clear the edge of the wire net fence, and with enough force, the ball will fly through the two to three metres of trees on the bank and then reverb on the tar seal below. The boy's ball did clear the fence, but then it ricocheted off a branch before it was caught in the girl's rictus palm. Astonishment in her wide eyes as she lay discarded on a bed of pine needles. Why am I telling you about a girl I don't know? This is a story about my town, Dunedin. By telling my version of this story, I'm re-stitching a divided self reattaching the pieces of my memory that have been forgotten or hidden along the way, tucked under trees. But now I must follow the different paths of light that pass through the prism of my city. My roots begin here, in my brother Richard's house that overlooks Prospect Park. The house that was my childhood home, two storeys, freestanding. What would have been built as a gentleman's residence on the edge of respectable Maori Hill. I'm house-sitting for the night while Richard and his family are out of town for my older nephew's rowing regatta. I'm guarding their property, possessions and most importantly their prized pooch, Gracie the Standard Poodle. Gracie springs to the window when she hears the boys cry, but doesn't bark. 
Living with two teenage boys, she's alert to chaos and hysteria, but a sharp judge of when and how to react. She's determined that her place is on the sidelines, in the house, with me. From the bed, we watch the police and ambulance arrive, and the crime scene tape rolled out. Come on, Gracie. Time to rise. At the top of the stairs is a portrait of my late mother, Marion, painted by my father in 1966. This is the only painting of his she permitted to hang after he took a turn for the abstract and surreal in the 70s. My father, Anthony Hepburn, encouraged my painting. He'd take me to the public art gallery that was then at Logan Park, a classically designed building constructed for the New Zealand and South Seas International Exhibition in 1925. I painted my way through university with little exhibitions here and there at cafes and small private galleries. Some still exist to this day, many micro-art movements later. I found I could make a quick buck sketching caricatures. Dad, who was a lawyer, was chuffed because there's a tradition of the court commissioning satirical portraits of newly appointed judges, a commission I'm yet to score. Mum, on the other hand, viewed these pen and paper sketches as cheap and a little smutty, much like my father's legal aid work before he was respectably made Queen's Counsel in 78. I sketched Mum once a little cameo in profile. When Rich and I cleared out her things after she died, we found the drawing wedged in her Edmunds cookbook between the savoury tarts and stuffed eggs. Dad's painting of Mum is three-quarter length and angle. Her Betty Davis eyes follow you in every direction. They suck you up and down the stairs, like the Lampson system vacuum pipes at Penrose's department store where she used to take me shopping for ribbons, tights and training bras. At Penrose's, on George Street, when your bill was added, a rounded sum of money with the docket was placed in the metal canister, sent up the Lampson pipe to the accounting department, the change settled out of sight, then the canister was sent back down and we were on our way. Standing sentinel to my mother's painting on the stairway wall are framed photographs of Richard and his family. My sister-in-law was Sarah when she came out of South Dunedin 25 years ago, but rechristened Sarah on arrival at Mari Hill. To the right of Sarah is my nephew, Matthew, who in Yankee parlance would be called a jock. His patrician nose and attitude echo his grandmother's. An attitude stating that the world has afforded him because why not? What has he ever done wrong? At age 17, I suspect nothing much. To Sarah's left is my impish younger nephew, Toby, freckled and fun and a little fraught in the confines of the frame. Toby is 15 and the oddball. But we don't use that label because in this day and age, labelling is harmful and reductive. I've drawn caricatures of all my family, updated every few Christmases. Last night, when I passed Matthew's room on the way to the bathroom, I saw that he had both the caricatures of him and Toby that I drew for them two years ago. They were pinned on the notice board above his desk, facing in towards each other. Entitled sod to take his brothers. I returned Toby's to his room and closed the door firmly behind me. We never used to lock our houses. We left money out with the milk. The court news published the names of people convicted of stealing the money, but it was never much of a deterrent for those who put the money out or those who took it. As Dad used to say, such large public shame for such a small gain. But since then, the gap between the haves and the haves not has grown even wider. Over the past five years, Richard has upped the security on his home. Machines monitor every movement and coming and going. Nevertheless, I don't like being alone in this house with its proximity to the park. People are rubbernecking, nosing for signs of the attack. 
In contrast, there's a thug of disinterest wafting from the student flat across the road where a party hummed and humped much of last night. The occupants are now airing themselves and chucking bottles into the recycling bin. It's a cruel cacophony and I'm relieved when Richard and the family return. I don't have the chance to speak to my brother or his sons, who are occupied with the minutiae of unpacking and sorting rowing regalia in the garage. At least, Matthew will be. Fastidious and proud, like how he treats himself. Every piece needs to be buffed and put back in its rightful place. Toby, on the other hand, will have scamped off up a tree or into a virtual forest behind a headset. There was a time when he talked to me about his adventures, but not any more. Not any more. Shall we go? That's Sarah, my sister-in-law. Louise. I take a moment, but don't find the answer. Uh, or the question, or, or, or the source of the question. The play. Oh, right. We should go. We'd made a date to watch the matinee of the Scottish play at the theatre in the garden. Macbeth at the Globe. The Globe Theatre was a house, and some of that remains. The theatre is a bulbous protrusion at one end. So many other theatres of my youth have disappeared, like the Art Deco Century Movie Theatre on Prince's Street. The St James on Moray Place had a ceiling of twinkling stars. After the building was gutted for renovation in the late 90s, Hamlet was staged on the stripped ground floor. Seating was on scaffolding and instead of wings, the actors emerged out of the shadows like apparitions. My father met my mother at the Globe when he saw her in a production of Lysistrata in the mid-60s. In 67, after they were married and had Richard, they both met poet James K. Baxter when mum was in Woman of Troy. I was in utero. Richard claims he remembers Baxter, who was Boone's fellow at the time. A literary post established at the university in 1958. Baxter came to dinner and my brother sat under the table staring at the poet's bare feet, caked in dirt and little bits of grass between his toes. <laughs> the Macbeth we're seeing this afternoon is directed by my friend Gavin, who did plays with me, Richard and Sarah here at the Globe in our secondary school and university days. Gavin is a skilled designer and builder. He built my studio in the garden behind the little villa I inherited from my great-aunt Fenella. He's bold and clever, but as we plunge into his punk-inspired Macbeth, I can't help thinking he's gone for overkill. I'll give thee a wind, that kind, and I another. I myself. Have all the other, and the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know, I, the shipman's car. I'm gripping the arms of my seat. I will drain him dry as hay. Mm, I'm chewing my nails. Shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live, a man forbid. It's too much. Weary, send night, nine times nine. OT2. Go, heat, window, peak and pine. We're being hit by too much. No, his bar cannot be lost. Yet it shall be temper time. It's already in the words. By Act 4, I'm holding Sarah's hand. Speak. Demand. We'll answer. Say, if that has rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. <laughs> We're out. We left early. 
I tell Sarah I'm just on edge because of the heat and the real thunderstorm late last night that broke my sleep. Then I'm babbling about the girl in the park. I'm, I'm not claiming the girl's tragedy, but something in it is sitting with me, stirring me within, making me sick at heart. Sarah hands me a bottle of water from a bag and I glug. I offer it back, but she flaps her hand in refusal and I'm relieved because I need something to grip, to ground me. We walk a long royal terrace with its dress circle view of the city, past the Buddhist centre and artist Francis Hodgkin's childhood home, then turn left at Ulverston, the house gifted to Dunedin by the spinster daughter. A house full of treasures from far-off places. Something my mother tried to emulate, passing on a certain covetness of things to Richard and me. Trinkets and totems from different times. Both Richard and I are spenders. My habit flourishes during dark episodes when I buy multiples of things online I can't really afford. Once the purchase has arrived, they're no longer appealing, so they get dropped off at op shops, the volunteers cheering my generosity. Thank God for Sarah who does the books for both me and Richard. Like Dad, Richard's got a brain for law, but not accounts. Sarah saved the house. She's saved family traditions. But she's not precious and enjoys upsetting the Murray Hill matrons. When she was in charge of the school football team uniforms, she swapped the other boys' new socks for second-hand ones. Other mothers' anointed sons' feet were running around in pre-sweated and athletes' foot-infused socks. Our first family dinner since last Easter. Easter Friday, when we made our own Golgotha, but failed to rise on Sunday. I haven't had a proper sit-down dinner with my family since then. This evening, Gracie sits at my feet. She's soothing my shaking from the witch's screams and thunder in the play. Matt, is Stella coming? Doesn't want to. Who's this? Stella. Who? Matthew's girlfriend. Oh, Stella. Yes, Richard, Stella. What's wrong with her? Nothing. She just doesn't want to come. Why not? We like Stella. Rich, leave it. Have we done something to upset your girlfriend? Richard! She thinks Toby's a perv. She what? Richard, I need you to carve this bird. What did Toby do? He freaks girls out. Richard, the chicken, now please. I think we need to get both Stella and Toby together. We need to get them together. We don't get them to do anything. They're free agents. Well, I don't want people thinking that this family... Matt! Shit! Jesus, Richard! It'll come out. I just washed this. Wine washes away conflict. It also makes my brother, and sometimes me, boorish. No, what makes Richard drunk makes me bold. Bold. Some people can't take bold. But you should allow yourself, give yourself permission to be bold. You put vinegar on it. Isn't that what mum used to do? Splash some vinegar on the stone? So the house can smell like a fish and chip shop. No, thank you. Last Easter, when I last broke bread with the family, Sarah said she couldn't, she wouldn't have this around the boys. And I said very boldly, won't you, Sarah? And I was leaving anyway before she said I had to leave. You won't have this around the boys, then this will excuse itself. And I boldly went like I had many times before. Lo, back me up here. Isn't that what mum would do? Put vinegar on the same? And zap, it's gone. (laughs) Out damn spot. (laughs) My home is not my house anymore, so if I behave badly, Sarah can tell me to leave. But not Richard. He gets to stay and they fight it out. Sometimes it concerns me, sometimes not. Things can get a little jagged at times. Things get tipped over all sorts of lines, visible and invisible, spoken and not. Thank God for Gracie, the puppy that reunited us. Cheers to Gracie. Kudos to Matthew for peacemaking with that dog. Drops by mine when her and he's out for a run and and I water them both before sending them on their panting way. But not before he makes small offers to help out. Light and slight as communion wafers, but symbolic of something larger. Lawn mowing, branch trimming, drain clearing, gentle 
patronizing of the spinster aunt. Have you finished with your glass, Auntie Lou? What? Do you want a cup of tea? Hmm? Tea. Where's Toby? Did I ask that already? I'm at that point you can't remember what you said out loud and what you only said in your head. So I say it again. Where's Toby? You've asked that four times already. Well, no one's answered. No one said anything about Toby. It's like he doesn't exist. And just like that, the boy appears, carrying a bundled red sleeping bag and a kiriru, a native New Zealand wood pigeon, holding it by its feet like a crucified saint. The iridescent blue and green of its feathers are an exquisite counter to Sarah's monochrome throw cushions. Blood runs from the bird's white breast down its beak and punches red splotches on the polished rimu floor. The dead bird sparks Gracie's senses. Richard rants about the prison sentence meted out to people who kill protected birds. Toby says it's car kill. Matt is instructed by his parents to dispose of the bird and Toby to wash his hands. Wash those damn spots out. Zap them away like vinegar on a stain. Out, damn spot. Out. With this and a half-finished bottle of Pinot under my arm, I make my way home. (laughs) My house, perched atop of the town belt, just one street over from Rich and Sarah's. This little villa was my great-aunt Fenella's, and it's still infused with her spirit and scent. As she used to say, I'm a modern luxury, a single woman with her own income. She lives in a cloud of Chanel Number no. 5. Whenever Richard or I travel overseas, we buy her a bottle on our way through customs and drop it to her at the retirement home up behind Highgate. I also keep a bottle on my dressing table. Not to wear, but to inhale when I need to unlock certain memories. Tonight, like last night, is muggy. I take the Pinot to my studio to paint. Recently, I've been using only brush pens to finish off commissions, but the hot evening calls for paint and music. The lines and paint flow with the wine, the rhythm underscored by the music. A bass I haven't detected before, deeper blues and greens. I I sip paint water by mistake. Spit it out and carry on. There's a man at my window. A man in my garden at my window. It's a policeman. Is this about the music? It's not about the music. It's not that late. Did my neighbours complain? It's not about the music. You should talk to them about that cat. He's the real menace. Dropped four birds at my back door in the past fortnight. It's about the attack at Prospect Park. Brains dashed out. A sorry sight. I want my lawyer. You don't need a lawyer. My father was a lawyer. I know my rights. I'm talking to you as a possible witness. We, We have reason to believe... Who's we? My partner and I. Where is he? Is he here too? He's talking to your brother. My brother? Richard? Yes, He's no killer. He's a pussy. And he wasn't even here. Not here. Not there, I mean. We know. We know. I mean, he wasn't at his house. I was at his house. We're aware of that. But I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything. I was asleep. You might have seen something. What I might or might not have seen isn't going to bring that girl back alive. I don't remember and she she won't either. She's alive. Alive? The girl in the park? She's in an induced coma, but she is alive. Distilled by magic slights, artificial sprites, illusion, confusion. You should talk to the kids next door. What kids? In the flat, across the road from my brother's. Two-storey place, big place, people always coming and going. Who knows who actually lives there? Call their landlord. Get hold of him. Look, get some sleep. We'll talk to you tomorrow. And I suggest you secure your back gate. It's banging in the wind and anyone could walk in from the path. 
This isn't the time to be complacent. Not the time? What is the time? Oh, light. And hell breathes as heaven looks on. Dark Dunedin was produced by Prospect Park New Zealand in Otipoti, the Edinburgh of the South, at Otago Access Radio. All episodes are written and directed by Emily Duncan and produced by H.J. Kilkelly. Dominic Angelo Lololi is the technician and original music is by Marama Grant and Eliza Picard. The actors in this episode are Julie Edwards as Louise Hepburn, Dimitri and Margot Latin as the Cricket Kids, Dougal Stevenson as the newsreader, Marama Grant as Sarah, Cheryl Amos as the witch, Robert Shand as Matthew, Phil Vaughan as Richard, Terry McTavish as Great Aunt Fenella, and Mark Nielsen as the policeman. Dark Dunedin was produced with the support from Creative Communities Dunedin, Dunedin Fringe Festival, the New Athenaeum Theatre, Olveston Historic Home, Archive Birds New Zealand, and Dunedin UNESCO City of Literature. <laughs>